I put this together um, and my webcam turned out it wasn't working right and didn't record the visual part. I hope you'll bear with me anyway um, and just listen because this I think is really important. Right now the wolves are coming out and attacking the sheep and they're using Matthew 7 and James 2. And it is really important that you understand how those chapters are misused and how to stand firmly in the face of them because there there is actually demonic inspiration behind taking these scriptures out and throwing them in your face which means that you need to treat it as a matter of spiritual warfare have your armor on Boy, the devil really doesn't want this to go out. He's giving me all kinds of technical difficulties. On with the message. I typically don't respond to a lot of these things where guys get on my wall and just out of the blue, you don't know who they are or what they want. <laughs> they just post a bunch of verses and like clearly they're offended or bothered by something you've said and Especially if you mention grace. Oh boy, if you mention grace, that'll get the wolves out. And uh, they'll get on and just start throwing verses at you from always the same verses. Always the same verses. Matthew 7, James 2. Matthew 7, James 2. They got, they got nothing else. So they have to take these chapters out of their context and ignore Paul. So anyway what I told this guy, here's the points I made. It's so frustrating, but these are important points. I know they're not going to make a difference with him, but I put them up in case someone stumbles across the thread and is confused about how to handle some of these, you know, things. He, he gave me verses from Matthew seven that indicated that unless my righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, I will in no wise enter the kingdom of heaven. And, uh, that is absolutely true. And you know what? You need to admit that if somebody says that to you, you're right. And if I break one of the least of these commandments and teach men, so he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven, but whoever shall do and teach them the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no way enter the kingdom of heaven. That is absolutely true. And you know what? It's not just those who teach the king, the law. You have to do them. Not just the ones you like, but even the very least of them you're responsible for, according to this righteousness, which the Lord is describing, that exceeds that of the Pharisees. So this person better be sure that he uh, is not just teaching them, but also doing and teaching them. Then he can be great in the kingdom of heaven. If he's just coming on my channel and throwing up some verses and telling me to do it, and he's not doing it himself, then he's got a problem. Because he's absolutely right. If his righteousness does not exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, he will in no wise enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, here's the points I made. Um, and I'll kind of break them down. Number one, if you do not have the righteousness of God, which is given as a gift to those who work not, but believe in Jesus Christ, who justifies the ungodly, then you do not have the righteousness that exceeds that of the Pharisees and you will not enter the kingdom period. You will not enter it if you do not receive the righteousness of God as a gift. And this righteousness is not for the godly, but for the ungodly. It's for those who recognize that they're ungodly, and they recognize that even if they thought they were working, they actually work not, because only Jesus Christ does any work worthy of mention in the kingdom. All the work has to come from him, through him, and he's working through us. If I see anything good in me or through me, it's because of Jesus Christ. I'm just a vessel 
that he passes it through. I have very little to do with it other than believing him. And you know what I believe? I believe that he justifies the ungodly. I am ungodly. I was ungodly. And you know what that qualifies me for? The free gift of righteousness. God gave it to me. And this is not my righteousness. This is not the righteousness of works. This is the righteousness of God. Only the righteousness of God exceeds the uh, righteousness that Jesus is talking about. Now, remember Paul, he said that the law, according to the law, he was blameless. And yet he counted that as dung so that he could lay hold of Christ. We'll get to that in a second. Christ is our righteousness. He has to be our righteousness. My second point was, if you are trying to establish your own righteousness in ignorance by adherence to the law, you are ignorant of God's righteousness. You are under the curse of the law because if you break it in one point, you've broken the whole thing. James and Paul agree there that even if you keep all of it, but break one point, you've broken the whole thing. Now, Paul's the one who goes further and says, look, if you put yourself under the yoke of the law, you will put yourself under the curse. Uh, he says this in Galatians, for as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, cursed is everyone that continues not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Remember what Jesus said, whoever shall break one of the least of the commandments and teach men to do so, he should be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever shall do, do and teach them, including the least, the same shall be called great. So if you want to be called great in the kingdom of heaven, then you have to keep the whole law and do it and teach every point of it. If you're going to establish your own righteousness by the law, that's the requirement. That's why, <laughs> that's why if you don't have the righteousness of Christ, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. If Paul couldn't enter in by his own righteousness, which he said he was blameless as far as the law is concerned, surely you and I Gentiles who know nothing of the law can even hope to enter in by that way. If you are trying to establish your own righteousness in ignorance by adherence to the law, you are ignorant of God's righteousness. That comes from Romans 10, 3, where he's talking about the Jews. They, he says, they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about trying to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. So, the, there's two righteousnesses. <laughs> there's my righteousness and there's God's righteousness. Now I can be ignorant and I can try to establish my own, but I need to submit myself to the righteousness of God, right? Paul says, look, if you go that way and you try to establish your own righteousness, you're putting yourself under the curse. And as a side note, he used circumcision in Galatians saying that if you're circumcised, you're obligated to the whole of the law. Because when you're circumcised, you put yourself under that system. And if you put yourself under even one of the least of the commandments, you're obligated to keep all the commandments. And that's why you're under a curse, because you cannot. You have flesh. You have sin. If you say you don't, you're a liar. So cursed is everyone who does not continue in all the things written in the book of the law to do them. So that was circumcision in Galatians, but I would say if you're thinking about it today, what about tithing? Are you under the law by tithing? Because if you obligate yourself through the tithe thinking that God will bless you because you tithe or curse you because you do not, then you're also obligating yourself to the rest of the law. You cannot have covetousness in your heart. You cannot have adulterous thoughts in your heart. You cannot hate your brother in your heart or you are guilty of murder. All of those things. If you have any failure in any one point, you've broken the whole thing. So if you tithe 
and you have no covetousness in your heart and you give away all your goods to the poor, but you find someone and you call him a fool, Jesus said you're in danger of hellfire if you call him an idiot and especially if you hate someone in your heart. So, uh, you know, if you're going to keep the law, be absolute about it. Don't get loose and greasy about it. Um, okay, here's the next point. If you transgress the law and do not have the faith of the blood of Christ and you reject the gift of righteousness, you are lawless and you will be told to depart from him as a worker of iniquity. I mean, the righteousness of God is given to us as a gift. It's a gift. It's a free gift. And the only way to receive it is as a gift. Therefore, by here's the Romans 5, 18, uh, 17. Here's a good one. For if by one man's offense, death reigned by the one, much more they who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. And what righteousness is that? Is it my righteousness? No, it's the righteousness of God that I need to receive. Sorry, I'm being a little dramatic and condescending here, but I am making points that I think are important. Um, okay, if you are teaching the law rather than God's economy, which is in faith, Paul says you have misaimed, not understanding what you affirm, and you are a vain jangler. I've never heard anybody else use that term and have swerved aside. This comes from 1 Timothy. He says, From which some, having swerved aside, turned aside unto vain jangling, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor what they affirm. In other words, they don't understand the purpose of the law is to condemn. It never, it never approves you. It only exposes you. It only condemns and convicts you. And when they teach the law, they're teaching their own condemnation. They do not understand that they are affirming their own condemnation. So when uh, he says, we know the law is good if a man uses it lawfully, Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient. This is 1 Timothy 1, 6 through 9, and I'll have all these verses in the description. The law was not made for the righteous, but the lawless and disobedient, for ungodly and sinners, unholy and profane, murderers and fathers and, mother, uh, and murderers of mothers and manslayers, and everyone who does things that are ungodly and against the gospel. So, the law is only to condemn the wicked. It is not to nourish the righteous. Okay? And if you think that you're helping someone by putting them under the law, you've misaimed. We put we help people believe in Jesus Christ. Okay, uh the law is a ministry of condemnation and death. Paul tells us this in 2 Corinthians he calls it a ministration of death in uh, 2 Corinthians 3, 7. But if the ministration of death written and engraved in stones was glorious so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was done away. And he goes on and he talks about, he contrasts the ministration of condemnation and death with the ministry of righteousness, which gives life. And some people will say, oh, well, we are under the moral law but what paul was talking about when he said we're not under the law he was talking about the ceremonial law no the ministry of death and condemnation was written and engraved in stones what is that that's the ten commandments that's the moral law that we are all guilty of broke breaking every every one of us without exception whether we're a christian or not Okay, um, finally, the law is a shadow, and the substance of the law is a person, not a thing. I say this quite a bit. Uh, you either have Christ, or you are in your sins. Christ is the end of the law to righteousness for everyone that believes. And uh, here's another one. If uh, 1 Corinthians one thirty, of him are you are in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. See, our righteousness is a person. It's Christ himself. He said, I came to fulfill the law. That's true. He's the end of the law. He is the fulfillment of the law. And if you don't have him, you don't have that righteousness. Okay. Now, Paul says, talking about this in Philippians, 
He says, I might have confidence in the flesh if any other one thinks that he has something to trust in the flesh. I more, touching the righteousness of the law, he says, I was blameless. He lists a bunch of things, but that one just jumps out at me. What things were gained to me, he says, those things I counted as loss for Christ, including the righteousnesses in the law. Those things I counted for uh, loss for Christ, yea, doubtless, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, person, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that righteousness, which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness of God, which is by faith. So there's two righteousnesses. There's your righteousness, which is of the law, which you don't have. Don't fool yourself. If you think that you have it, it's because you're ignorant of the righteousness of God and you have not submitted yourself to the righteousness of God. Then there's the righteousness of God. And the only way to have that is through faith in Jesus Christ. And this is a free gift to him who works not, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly. And this is the righteousness that exceeds that of the Pharisees. And this is the righteousness that will allow us to enter the kingdom of heaven. And if you don't have it, he will tell you, depart from me. I never knew you because it's about knowing Jesus and being known by him. And the way we Know Jesus is to know him as our righteousness. That's the first thing. Finally, if you do not receive the kingdom as a child, you will not enter in. Jesus told us that. You have to receive it as a child. And a child has no righteousness of their own, no competency, no strength of their own to look at. They can't justify themselves. They have to receive everything because they are entirely dependent on the Father. And that's us. So now the other thing he gave me was James 2. Of course, they always go to James 2 if, you know, faith without works is dead. Now, James, at some point, I'm going to have to do a study on this. I don't like to do it, but it is true. You can't just glibly reconcile James with Paul and say that these are two sides of the same coin um, without doing some real juggling you have to figure out for yourself why is james in the bible if it's never given you a problem then either you don't appreciate paul's ministry or god's just had a lot of mercy on you because anyone i know who's intellectually honest will look at what james said about justification and look at what Paul said about justification and say, wait a second, these are two different things. Either the justification they're referring to is something different or they're not in agreement. And a lot of people don't like to even think that they might not have been in agreement. And there is a possibility that they were not because James may have been written before Acts 15 Acts 15 was the big council where Paul went up by revelation to Jerusalem to address the matter of the fact that Peter, under pressure from those that had come to him from James, had backed off from sitting with the Gentiles and created a big issue for the churches in Galatia. And Paul had to rebuke him in front of everybody in order to maintain the truth of the gospel. Now, when he went up to uh, Jerusalem in Acts 15, there was much contention. And you find James surrounded by Pharisees, who some of which they, they had believed that Jesus was Messiah. But James said later that they're all zealous for the law. That's a problem. And they were hanging around the temple. They had not really made a full transition to understand the new paradigm um, that came about because of the death and resurrection of Christ. And that's not their fault, but Paul was given the gift and the stewardship and the revelation of that mystery. And it wasn't until Acts 15, as far as we know, that Paul came and explained the gospel that had been given to him. 
And there was a lot of contention, and Peter finally had to stand up for Paul. And the result was a sort of compromise with those letters that went out. But we see that the apostles in Jerusalem were not clear yet about the new um, revelations that had been given to Paul concerning justification by faith and imputed righteousness and the church is the body of Christ and being crucified with Christ and raised together with him and seated in the heavenlies with him and all the things that God had given Paul that that the death of Christ had accomplished. Prior to that, the gospel was preached in a way uh, in Jerusalem that the death was something that Israel needed to repent of because they'd murdered their Messiah and rejected their kingdom as a result because he's their king. So they needed to repent for doing that so that they could receive their kingdom. And that's what they were promised by the apostles in Acts. They said, look, it, you repent so that the time of refreshing and he may send Jesus to restore all things. He's saying, look, you killed the Lord of life, the author of life, and you need to repent of that. See, they looked at it as this is a terrible sin you committed. And that is true. But you don't see a preaching of the gospel that like what Paul describes about justification about all the things that you could not be justified under the law of Moses. And even in Acts 21, it seems like there was still a lot of confusion because James had Paul go into the temple and take a vow to show all the Jews there who he said believed in Jesus but were zealous for the law. We have thousands of them, he said. He made Paul take a vow to show that he had not apostatized from Moses and from the temple. And it's a mystery why Paul actually carried that out, but that led to the end of Paul's public ministry. A riot broke out, and that sent him to prison. Now, that was God's plan, too, because it was in prison that God gave him the ability to write about the high peaks of his revelation, Ephesians, Galatians, or no, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians, the prison letters, and Timothy. Uh, This... So that was good. His richest ministry came from prison. But clearly there was a problem in Jerusalem. And we read James, and for some reason, people put him higher than Paul. And anytime you mention grace among religion people, all you have to do is mention grace. And they immediately want to jump in and qualify it. And what do they qualify it with? Matthew 7 and James 2. So you better be clear about your view, especially of James. And I think there's a, there's a few different approaches I've seen. Some reconcile it with Paul and say, look, James is clearly talking to brothers. He believes they're brothers. He calls them beloved brothers and says they're born of God. And he does not think that they are not saved. He is not saying that their faith is like demons. He is talking about justification in a way that benefits man. He's talking about, look, you got to help your brothers. You can't just say, I believe, while your friend and brother is sitting there in need. Let your faith have action. That's fine. That's fine to say. Uh, And I agree. There's grace in James's epistle. Um, But if you try to use it to fight against the gospel of Jesus Christ. You are a heretic. If you fight Paul's revelation of justification using James chapter 2, you are making James say what he's not saying there. And then there's also a broader context where if James was really the first epistle ever written, and it was written to Jews from James in Jerusalem, before Acts 15, then that would explain why there's no reference to the death of Christ or our being crucified with him or the blood of Jesus or anything Pauline in it. And you can see why Luther would come to the conclusion that it was a, there, he, he said it was straw. There wasn't much Pauline truth in it. That's true. You got to admit that. But people aren't willing to take a broader view of the scriptures and look at things in their context and rightly divide the word of truth. They, for some reason, put James above Paul. And that historically goes back to the fact that 
you know, why did the Pharisees like James so much? Why was he so respected? When you think about it, they killed their Messiah, Jesus Christ, the son of David. They knew he was probably the Messiah. Some of them may not have believed that he rose from the dead, but they believed that he was of the lineage of David. And guess who else is the lineage of David and heir to the throne? Jesus' brother, James. So when you look at church history, you see almost immediately an exaltation of James. They call him James the Just. And, you know, believe me, he is a very godly man. I, you know, I'm not undermining James himself, but it does seem like the religion that built up around him was toxic. And clearly we see in the book of Galatians that it was brothers from James and the confusion in Jerusalem and the circumcision and false brothers that went out and stirred up trouble among all the churches that eventually caused all the churches in Asia to depart from Paul's ministry. And today, even still, people say Paul was a false apostle and a heretic. James didn't say that. James received and rejoiced when Paul came and finally told him everything that God had accomplished to him, through him in those 14 years of his ministry. When Paul talked about what God had shown him, the apostles rejoiced greatly and recognized the grace of God, including James. So you can't say that James thought Paul was a false apostle and you shouldn't make James disagree with Paul. But God did leave that epistle in there and gave us the context of the book of Acts to show us, look, there was a transition happening from Judaism and the temple to the new way that was uh, represented by Paul's ministry. And you have to acknowledge that. I, I don't understand why people are so dumb when they read the Bible that they don't dig into the truth and look at the history and look at the context and show us and, and use the word of God to interpret itself and go, okay, what did, what did the other books of the Bible say about James and Paul? There's, there's context there. There's history. You should look into it. And I'm not being dogmatic about any of it. But when you come at me with James 2, trying to refute justification by faith, by just giving me the faith of the works is dead verse, you're just being dumb. And all you're doing is being a parrot. And you have no idea what you're talking about. It's very irritating. Sorry. I'm sorry if this was not the most edifying thing I've ever said. <laughs>